Good evening. So I'm Charlotte Vignon, curator of decorative arts um, here at the Frick Collection. And um, I am delighted to welcome tonight uh, David Pullins to speak um, here at the Frick. A very bright young scholar who specialized in French visual imagery and culture from the 17th to the 19th century. David, David is a PhD uh, candidate at Harvard University where he's finishing his dissertation. Actually, I just learned that he finished it because he's going to defend it next week. So. <laughs> and his PhD is entitled uh, Cut and Paste, the mobile image of uh, from Vato to Piedmont. This innovative project explores the circulation and repetition of images among academic painters and the impact of their work method and other, on other craft and trade in 18th century French um, art and society. Please turn off your cell phone. It's a nice reminder for all of us. Um, David's research has been supported by very prestigious uh, fellowships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and more recently at the National Galleries of Art Center for the Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, which had, uh, award him a three years uh, fellowship, um, the David E. Finlay uh, Fellowship. Before commencing his PhD program at Harvard, David uh, earned his master's degree in art history at the Courthood Institute of Art in London. He has given a uh, lecture uh, at Harvard University and the Royal Institute of British Architects in London and contributed to numerous conferences and panels organized in both sides of uh, the Atlantic as well as in Tokyo. But on top of all of um, these major um, academic accomplishments, um, David, as David, sorry, I really call you David now. <laughs> David has a very special uh, space um, in our arts uh, here at the Freck, um, where we watch him grow and flourish over six years as a research assistant and curatorial assistant uh, before moving to Harvard. So we are all very excited to have him here tonight to share uh, with us um, his discovery. So please uh, join me in welcoming David Pollins. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for such a warm introduction, and so many of you for being here. I'm really touched uh, by your presence, and also it's so true having spent several truly treasured years here in the curatorial department. I'm particularly thrilled uh, to be here and have been asked to return <laughs> to speak tonight. Uh, I also want to thank Charlotte uh, and Xavier Salmon for proposing the idea, and members of Rika Berman's uh, education department, particularly Adrian Lay and Caitlin Henningsen for making this all so easy. Something that has preoccupied art historians with <laughs> increased regularity in recent years is trying to determine the relationship between the decorative arts and painting. In fact, as art history looks more and more globally to consider objects outside the Western tradition in which oil on canvas is not the main medium of artistic expression, the integration of decorative arts into the story of art history has become generally more pressing. On one level, this has caused greater attention to be paid to long undervalued objects. The current exhibition of Sev here at the Frick is an example of this. And it has also revealed the degree to which the division between fine and decorative is geographically and historically specific. We might be surprised to learn, for example, that many of Frick's contemporaries, in England especially, began actually by collecting decorative arts and actually acquired paintings by Boucher and Fragonard afterwards in order to cover the walls of rooms that were already quite richly furnished. In my talk this evening, I would like to take this a step further, however, and propose that this is not simply a matter of rethinking hierarchies, that we should take both fine and decorative arts into account, but that there is an opportunity here to think in new ways about art historians' traditional purview, which is painting. Or also sculpture, but I'll be focusing on painting this evening. For 18th century France, this is, as scholars have recently underlined, particularly promising. Many of the distinctions between fine and decorative arts that we operate with today are in fact inherited from developments made in Paris by, on the one hand, the Académie Royale, which defined painting as an autonomous field 
divorced from questions of the market and artisanal labor. And on the other hand, Diderot and D'Alembert's encyclopedia, which recorded in meticulous detail the mechanical processes of artisanal expertise in every conceivable trade. But it is in the potential instability of the division between these categories of fine and decorative arts during the 18th century that my interest lies and where I think we may have the most to learn. 18th century painting has long held an awkward and at times even embarrassing position in a respectable history of art. The relay is made pretty hastily and usually between Baroque theatricality and Jacques-Louis David, whose students, after all, were the first, apparently, to coin the term Rococo to deride paintings associated with Carl van Loo and Madame de Pompadour. The lingering sense that while executed in oil on canvas, there was something inherently decorative in 18th century French painting, variously described as light, feminine, playful, or superfluous, might actually hold some truth here. This is not because these works are any less important than a painting by Rembrandt or Picasso, but rather, I think, because paintings by artists like Watteau, Boucher, and Van Loo reveal in important ways the real continuity on a material level between painting and making objects of many different kinds in a broad range of media. This includes, of course, objects like Sev that we now consider decorative arts. My investigation of these questions began with the problems that images such as these figural vignettes pose for art historians. It was an investigation that actually began in this room at a Frick IFA symposium. Although this kind of image that you see here was formulated by a leading academician and easily tied to his more conventional production for the Salon, it was never intended as a finished work of art, but as an impetus for further production. Printed by Gabriel Uquier in 1740, Boucher's motifs enjoyed tremendous success throughout the remainder of the century and epitomized a vast body of figural ornament marketed via print, usually, to artisans in the porcelain, metalwork, furniture, and textile industries. Here is a particularly spectacular example from Sev, probably first owned, although we're not certain, by Madame de Pompadour, who was an important early patron of the factory. In the study of decorative arts, the ubiquity of such images has long been ascribed to the celebrity of their authors, be it Boucher, Watteau, or others. And this rightly situates them as products that appealed to an urban consumer who was sensitive to shifts in fashion. Despite the way such images do not resemble conventional easel paintings, artists' proper names and titles were employed when such prints were announced for sale and even invoked when objects decorated with them were listed in 18th century inventories and sales catalogs. In this sense, they bear out the realities of celebrity authorship as it was forged by the Academy Royale and its salon. The successful commodification of images is, however, equally reliant on Boucher's sophisticated engagement with how images function, I think, not at the reception end, bought by a customer, printed by Uquier, but at the production end, through a deep knowledge of the use value of particular kinds of images for artists and an understanding of what would be the most flexible and perhaps the most useful kinds of image. This kind of image is what I've been calling in my work a mobile image, engineered in a way for replication and circulation in a vast array of contexts, including but hardly limited to Sev. Art historians have given little sustained attention to the formal qualities of these images, usually allowing it to suffice that they were objects meant for commercial benefit, economically tied to artisanal production. But I would like now to look at them as compositions with the seriousness that we might accord to a painting at the Salon. Boucher's key decision in each of his five senses here was to prioritize the center of the image and to establish it as a magnet around which figures and objects could gravitate. In taste and touch, seen here at the bottom right, the center is marked by a dominant vertical line, in one case a tree trunk and in another the urn. The implied weight of the urn and the expanse of roots assumed to accompany such substantial vegetation provide a gravitational pull at the center of the image that anchors it, despite the most rudimentary depiction of a support. On examination, in fact, the turf is nothing more than a rakai scattering of wispy vegetation and exotic accessories. 
Rather than rely strictly on vertical, on a vertical line in smell uh, and vision, the site of anchoring is embodied by an object appropriate to the given allegory. These are at the top of the screen. In these cases, it allows for a doubling of subject matter and compositional center as the figures peer into, adorn, and caress the sensor at upper right and the peep show box at the left. Through an excessive filling of the center with figures and objects, Boucher's compositional decisions avoid the problems of distancing what we see from the picture plane by aggressively blocking the conventional location of greatest spatial expansion. The figural group is neatly contained for the consumption of the eye. Each of the images in the series is atomatized, made present, and offered up as a kind of object. An appropriate condition for images that were treated less as illusionistic windows onto the world and more as material objects for physical manipulation. They functioned much like prints for decoupage that sat easily on the surface of the monochrome objects, porcelain, false lacquer, textiles that were common in the decorative arts. Here as one example from the Met uh, with copies of various prints, including one from this series in a kind of false lacquer produced in France. And uh, just to give you a sense of a contrasting example to this kind of individuated image. The supposing example is a print that does perhaps not engage with this. It it's, has a perspective and it fills out the entire sheet. Rather, in Boucher's figural vignettes, um, this format is integrated into, or perhaps more accurately onto, the surface. Their tattered edges ease the transition between Boucher's studio and the greater world. Returning to the Sev vase, we can confirm how useful this proved. The lack of depth allows the image to take to the surface of the sensuous vase as it curves inward. With the aid of a floral band, the tattered edge meets the surrounding decoration as it moves into garlands, followed by an altogether non-representational pattern of blue and gold dots on a white ground along the, the top shoulder of the vase. In fact, the centripetal power of Boucher's two-dimensional image is reinforced when placed against this three-dimensional body of the vase. Its bulbous center seems to take its cue or flesh out the two-dimensional representation of the sensor at the center, pushing it out towards us. Boucher then was especially capable of engaging with the issues important to producing decorative arts objects. This, it is important to stress, at the level of using two-dimensional images not the technical questions of actually producing works in porcelain, marquetry, or textiles. Not only did each of these trades require a degree of frankly mind-boggling specialist knowledge, as detailed by Diderot and D'Alembert in the encyclopedia, but guild restrictions would actually have prevented a painter from learning or practicing these various distinct trades. But if Boucher was, as his professional training indicates and the Academy Royale was adamant on establishing, first and foremost a painter, painter to the King of France, what aspects of his training and his own painting practice allowed for this deeply sophisticated engagement with decoration? And ultimately, the key question perhaps, what can this tell us about the decorative aspects in the kinds of conventional paintings, the artworks, we know by Boucher and his fellow academicians who were painting in 18th century Paris? I would like to address this through several groups of objects that touch on ways artists made their works, beginning with those associated with painters' education, expanding out to the painting studio and related studio practices, and we'll tie in here several points to the fantastic Van Dyke show, which is currently up here at the Frick as well, as I try to weave fine and decorative arts. Um, then, we'll see, I, I hope that you, that you agree. Then finally, at the end, uh, a more sustained way, I want to discuss a kind of painting Boucher and his contemporaries knew by heart that is little recognized today, but is in fact, I believe in many ways, the oil on canvas counterpart to the prints that we've been examining here in such detail. To begin then uh, by learning how to draw. Charles Nicolas Cochin's vignette illustrating drawing for the encyclopedia is one of the most regularly cited representations of early modern art education. It outlines the sequential organization by which all painters, sculptors, and craftsmen in other trades learned to draw. First, copying two-dimensional models, which you see at the left, then progressing to three-dimensional casts or sculpture in order to master shadow. This you can see in the middle. 
and finally reaching the live model, or what was known as the Académie, this last being a kind of training to which the Académie Royale had varying degrees of exclusive rights in 18th century France. Typically, Cochon's vignette is used by art historians to demonstrate that the culmination of learning to draw was the live model. This is even evident in the composition used by Cochin. But focus on its culmination in the live model means we have given little attention in the process to the inverse, the earliest stages of training. When the youngest students, only eight to 10 years old, copied two-dimensional motifs, they did so according to academic models inherited from Italy, and this is a representation of that history, they learned through individuated pieces of the body. And eventually, figures, entire figures extracted from larger old master compositions that were isolated in order for students to master them individually. And here in the detail on the left, you can see individuated eyes that the instructor is pointing out and explaining perhaps uh, to very young students. Here we have uh, an 18th century example of such a two-dimensional uh, motif in print. This kind of motif was, in short, an art education that functioned in parts. And indeed, the ambitious instruction manual that, from which these come was partially authored by Kosha. And the text warned that overattention to individuated pieces risked drawing bodies that actually didn't hold together. Mastery of ears and limbs, but not any of their connective tissue. Be that as it may, the cumulative method of instruction was universally accepted in France. As Cochin himself announced in a lecture in 1777, no matter the future trade, textile designer, pa flower painter at Sevres, or painter to the king, the initial steps of copying two-dimensional motifs was taken. Ideally, all students reached the logical conclusion of this, passing via sculpture, but this was hardly necessary for most craftsmen many people would never reach the live model. The phenomenon of this kind of training in 18th century France, particularly after 1740, of École de Dessin, drawing schools to support the various trades, are evidence of this. Legally, as per the Academy's privileges, it was often too complicated, or actually altogether forbidden, for these schools to even offer the live model to their students. Rather, they used prints such as we've been looking at uh, here. So we can see then that at a foundational level for craftsmen and painters alike, when they learn to draw, which was the preliminary step for any uh, future visual art training, they also developed in the process a sense of thinking through individuated parts. This might be a curious but inconsequential reality were it not for the fact that many 18th century artists, this practice and the logic I think that it instilled bled into their mature production well into their careers. The most celebrated instance of this is Vato, and an aspect I think that will be further addressed in the exhibition we're looking forward to this summer here at the Frick. Vato established motifs in drawing, either of his own or copies plucked from other painters, then recycled them in his paintings, often over the course of years. Here's a somewhat classic example. He removes a figure from a composition that's actually much larger by Rubens via drawing in order to place it in an altogether different context and in a different scale in the surprise. A stunning painting that some of you may have had the opportunity to see here a couple years ago at the Frick. Vato's practice was commented on in his own lifetime and generally criticized. But among painters, it is actually less idiosyncratic than 18th century commentators and many subsequent art historians have typically led us to believe. In this example from 1736, we see that Boucher has taken a figure from the animal painter Udry for an extremely high profile commission, a series of exotic hunts he and other leading academicians painted for Louis XV. The practice of recycling continued through the century particularly when an artist painted something outside his primary genre. Here, of course, Boucher, mainly a figure painter, um, used an animal painter's motif, taking the figure of the leopard from Udry. In the 1760s and 1770s, Hubert Robert, who was known for his landscapes and ruins, but criticized, actually, for his ability to paint figures, recycled figures from Boucher. This is evident here in these paintings. 
Boucher's figures at the left reappear in Robert's painting on the right, in a move that I think is not unlike that associated more often with Watteau. A wonderful evocative sheet in the Courtauld is a rare survivor that reveals the artist's methods here. Robert has painted together, or painted, pasted together a drawing, crayon manner prints, which resemble drawing, after Boucher, and his own drawn copies of Boucher all together on a single sheet of paper, a kind of conglomerate that held these motifs for future use. This practice ties back, of course, to the kinds of two-dimensional models from which students learn to draw. And indeed, many artists, including Boucher, played a role in producing these images for circulation. And here I show Boucher's etching from 1735 for Book of Studies after the original drawings of Abraham Blomart, who was a 17th century painter, but these prints from 1735 made them available for 18th century artists to use in their own work. From artist training, I would like to move now to the question of studio production and the way that artists, particularly young artists entering a large studio, thought about images as discrete units and the canvas not actually as an integrative whole, as we usually assume it to be, but as a fragmented kind of surface. Historians of art made before 1700 are typically much more comfortable with this idea of studio production either as the part of workshop practice in early guilds, particularly in Italy, or maybe most spectacularly in its late flowering with Rubens. Van Dyck, as we see here, was of course one of student, the students of Rubens, one of his most celebrated um, disciples. While documentation, however, in contrast for 18th century uh, France is surprisingly poor, we know that the period's largest studios, those of Desport, Udry, and Boucher, regularly employed this traditional distribution of labor, typically according, again, to specialties by genre. The portrait, for the portraitist Hyacinth Rigaud, we have a detailed account book that actually specifies which sections of a painting would be repeated elements taken from studio model books and executed by assistants at a reduced cost. The famous oil studies by Udry's master, the portraitist Nicolas Logilier, which you see here on the right, are now understood to have been models for assistants to copy into portraits. Each of those you see here was used at least once, others up to four times in extent portraits from his studio. And I include here on the left uh, Paul Menyard's portrait of his brother to give you a sense of how this might work, uh, how one might use a drawing to insert a figure into a painting. Here, of course, a drawing the Virgin Mary being inserted uh, into uh, his canvas. Assistants who, ex who excelled at a particular genre, flowers, figures, animals, might break off in order to specialize in this independently. And a possibly apoc apocryphal tale actually relates that Udry discovered his own genre, animal painting, when he was working in his master's studio painting a dog into a portrait. Given that we are in New York, I can't help but jump a bit chronologically and show you wonderful examples of how this might appear uh, from the Matt Breuer's uh, unfinished show, a work by Mengs that seems to await uh, additions by specialists of an animal, uh, animal painter or portraitist. Comparably, a work that's just on the other side of this wall by Van Dyck, um, the face has been completed to a high degree of finish and perhaps awaited a, a drapery painter to fill out the remainder of the portrait that the master didn't want to spend his time with. In a sense, if you were to combine these two paintings in a way, you would have a finished portrait. So this division by genre is quite important. Increasingly in the 18th century, this distribution of labor was not praised, however. It was also a practice that certain painters, like Udry, felt the need to speak out against. In 1749, before the Academy, Udry characterized studio assistance with its replication of motifs that distributed work as, quote, infinitely dangerous, regardless of whether the person to do the filling in is competent or not. This, he said, we know that he said this, he spoke to the Academy Royal, and it's, it's recorded this was his public pronouncement, but we know from his surviving work, as you see here, it is clear that Udry frequently distributed labor to assistants to repeat elements from earlier compositions. The black buck on the right has been dropped into a new context, 
in which the placid figure sits, I think, quite oddly with a group of lunging hounds for which it was never intended. This lack of fit, this kind of disjunction, is more often associated with Vato when he combined different figures who might not have a relationship, uh, any kind of uh, obvious relationship to each other. But I think it's equally, this incongruity is equally apparent here. This is also uh, evident, I think, in a detail of one of, uh, of this first painting, the one that you saw on the left, this detail that I think drives home the kind of disjunctions that occur when canvases are thought of in terms of parts, in this case, figure and ground. The way individual component, components, uh, the individual components fail to integrate uh, with the rest attests, in fact, to Udry's own criticism of the practice, even though this is a painting from Udry. We might also note here that Udry's older contemporary, the fellow animal painter Desport, is said to have quipped that he, quote, liked works by Udry well enough when they were entirely by his hand. In Rubin's time, it was well known that he collaborated horizontally, a term that is quite helpful. He collaborated horizontally with other artists, which is to say not assistants, but equally celebrated and mature painters, such as Jan Bruegel, Franz Snyders, and indeed, probably Van Dyck. Here you see a painting in which Rubens executed the figure and Snyder's the eagle. The logistics of this kind of collaboration are worked out by Snyder's accompanying drawing, which is now in the British Museum, as you see at the right. Though less well acknowledged in 18th century France, this practice continued there. The portraitist, La Gilière, Oudry's master, for example, appears to have had a regular relationship with the flower painter Bellin, with very little attempt to disguise the discrete contributions of the two artists, as you see here. Watteau's supply of figures to architecture and landscape painters is attested to by a report from the Swedish diplomat and collector Tessin in 1715, when he visited Watteau's studio. We also have a substantial batch of textual evidence in the form of sales catalogs and inventories, something that Martin Eidelberg has uncovered in particular. Probably because such works did not satisfy later de definitions of painting as products from single authors, one painter rather than multiple ones, there are actually very few survivals, though I show this one here, which is currently in Grenoble, and which, to which Vato added figures uh, to a landscape ground by a now much less famous artist. For some 18th century dealers and collectors, this process also allowed for the improving of old master compositions or the playful juxtaposition of an old master painter and a contemporary painter. Watteau's follower, Nicolas Lancre, seems to have made a particular business of adding fashionably dressed 18th century figures to 17th century Dutch interiors. At least six, including this example in the Wallace, are recorded atop panels by, by or were once attributed to David Teniers or William Kauff. The ground in this instance is typical of Kauff's kitchen interiors from the, seven, from the 1640s. But probably around 1730, Lancre added a servant girl, provocatively searching for fleas. The subject actually enjoyed some popularity at the time as a sexually alluring literary topus. And Xers reveal, in fact, that it covers Kauff's far less titillating old servant woman. Many such works as these had, that had Lancre editions, and we know through inventories, et cetera, these Lancre editions were often removed subsequently, even in the last 50 years or so, as you see here for this painting in St. Louis. In the instance of the Kauff Lancre examples, at least, it was Kauff's later reputation that outshined Lancre's and resulting in this kind of desire for pure work and the removal of his figures. What I'm trying to suggest then in working you through these images is a way of thinking about canvases here that are the product not of a single maker but essentially collaborative. In this, they approximate, simply to tie us back to the touchstone example from Sev, many of the modes of production used in the decorative arts. Modes of production that, to stress the point, are usually um, re readily acknowledged in the study of decorative arts but underplayed in stories of painting or stories of painting as told by art historians who are usually working in monographic studies in which the single author is very important and this kind of shared workshop method is difficult to accommodate. 
To bring us further along into the world of decoration, however, I want to move to an extremely popular mode of dec decorating interiors in 18th century France, the arabesque. In many ways, how these works were created approximates a large painting studio. And indeed, when in the 1690s, a representative from the Swedish court was charged with finding a decorative painter in Paris, he wrote back of his difficulty. For this kind of decoration was, he said, always executed not by a single artist, but by a large team comprised of specialists in different genres. As developed by Claude II and then his nephew, Claude III Audrin, the arabesque dominated decorative painting in France from the end of the 17th century well into the 1720s. With few surviving finished works, it is difficult to recapture the tremendous impact of this workshop on artistic life in early 18th century Paris, and its place as a training ground for many artists, including Fateau, an example of which you just saw, also for Desport and for Oudry. What is available in the absence of many extant uh, works is an incredible group of some 1900 drawings that survive today complete from the workshop and they're now in Stockholm. The advantage of these drawings is that they emphasize practice. For while the group includes presentation drawings, the majority are working materials with pinholes and cutouts, evidence of pouncing, notations, squaring, and corrections in multiple hands. Attribution of these drawings is extremely difficult. And here you can see some of these diverse features. Technically, the structure of arabesques from the Otron workshop is remarkably consistent. And you can see this particularly in the image on the right. A symmetrical skeleton is established, often through drawing one quarter or one half of the design, first in graphite and then in red chalk in order to fold it over and produce a counterproof, a mirror image of it before the key lines are usually reinforced in ink. Within this exacting symmetry, reserves or blanks are left throughout, awaiting the insertion of an endless variety of discrete figural, animal, or vegetal units, such as the Chinese figure here at the left, in the left image. According to the Comte de Caillus, moreover, Audouin, quote, would reserve places in these sorts of compositions for different subjects to be determined by the wishes of the individuals decorating their ceilings and paintings in this genre. A material manifestation of this approach to the individuated unit in surviving drawings is the regular appearance of layered options tipped in on a given design, providing Audouin or the client with a series of alternate motifs to choose from. While Audrin seems typically to have laid out the overall structure, he relied on individual painters to insert their contributions according to their specialties. But what was put together as discrete units could also be taken apart. The structural logic was clearly appreciated by the young Boucher when he etched images by Watteau for a lost, from a now lost chinoiserie cabinet at the Chateau de la Muette. At La Muette, Boucher was confronted by walls decorated with chinoiserie figures painted by Watteau into a decorative frame. Boucher's task was to extract figures from the structure in order essentially to set them back into circulation in prints, such as you see here at the upper right. The procedure of Audran's workshop and of the arabesque is reversed, but its logic as a system for thinking is essentially respected. Boucher engraved 12 figures from La Mouette in this fashion for Jean de Julien's massive publication of the painted and drawn oeuvre of the recently deceased Watteau. In fact, Boucher would emerge as the principal engraver among the project's large team. Such images joined sheets compiled by Watteau's working drawings of, from what, Watteau's working drawings of a more conventional pattern book type used by artists. While aimed at collectors and amateurs, Julian's publication of prints was also rapidly appropriated as a pattern book by artists across media, as attested to by the innumerable objects of fine and decorative art bearing motifs after Watteau and print advertisements that listed the diverse materials into which his images might be translated. One of the most spectacular examples of this was made at Sevres, seen here. A table delivered in 1774 to Madame du Berry at her recently completed Chateau de Louvciennes, the building for which the Fragonard room panels here at the Frick were also painted. 
The mahogany body of this table was carved by Martin Carlin, and its tilt top was composed from seven Sev porcelain plaques enameled by Charles Nicolas Dodin. These images are based on prints that reproduced figural vignettes by Watteau in the surround, and Le Concert du Grand Sultan by Carl Van Loo, a painting that had been shown at the Salon some 30 years before and repeated here in the center. Known as a Girardin, this table form folded down when not in use, or in this instance, perhaps simply in order to show off these Sev plaques. It was coordinated by a Marchand Mercier, Simon Philippe Poirier, who overcame the guild divisions between these various trades, porcelain, metalwork, and carving wood, and would have been seen from the patron's point of view as the one responsible for the final version as we know it and as we see it here. Like the head of a painter's studio or the head of a large team of artists working the arabesque, Poirier functioned as a coordinator of other artists in order to complete one complete work. Having made this kind of journey through, uh, one might say, the peripheries of 18th century painter's practice, in the remaining time, I'd like to make a comparison between an object like the Duberry table, or indeed Pompadour's Sev vases with which we opened, and a particular format of painting known as chantourné, or cut out, cut out format painting. These irregularly shaped canvases were intended not as independent easel paintings, but for installation into decorative wall paneling or boiserie, such as we saw from Watteau, the dissembled room from La Mouette. While this may seem like a very specific subgenre, in fact, many 18th century French paintings that you see in museum galleries are works that were extracted from this kind of context and then either built out or cut down in order to tr achieve the rectangular formats that subsequent art dealers and collectors read as works of art. Here at the Frick, Boucher's Four Seasons, painted for Pompadour, still hold traces of their original irregular forms. And I show you two views of the installation. They were, after they were removed, they were turned into rectangles. And uh, in 1931, when they were shown, that rectangle was retained. And now, as you see them uh, in the West Vestibule, you'll see them in an irregular format that more approximates uh, their original uh, the original form, but it also points out the difficulties of displaying this kind of work. The term chantourné, which is most literal, means cut out, does not enter official dictionaries in France until 1762, when it was defined as a piece of upholstered wood located between the bedside and headboard, indicating that the term had as much to do with the skills of the woodworkers producing the stretchers on which the canvas was stretched and the painter painted as it had to do with the image itself. In fact, uh, we can see this kind of image, it's probably not exactly it, but it's, it's relatively close uh, in the stripe section of this painting here by Boucher at the Frick from 1743. In order to help you understand this a bit, I'm showing a close-up of a painting here by Boucher on the left, um, in which the stretcher, which remains, shows through, and you can see it showing through here, it's this irregular format. And this is the reverse of the kind of paneling it would have been inserted into. And in the highest quality, highest quality examples, this very close fit was made. And in fact, the room would have to be destroyed in order to take the paintings out because it was built from the back uh, forward. In the Mercure de France, meanwhile, this term, chantourné, is used regularly to describe ephemeral cutout decoration that was part of festival and funerary trappings. Standing then between the bedroom and temporary embellishment, while underscoring not the illusion of the canvas, but its status as a constructed object, the word must have done little to elevate the painter's profession in the eyes of the academy. It was essentially this word and the kinds of things that uh, were associated with it was that of artisans, specifically of woodworkers. And indeed, the number of such works as this that were shown at the Academy's Salon, in fact, decreased markedly by the end of the 1750s. Their peculiar displacement is indicated, I think, here in Gabriel de Saint-Aubin's depiction of the Salon of 1765 by the awkward way in which even oval canvases, certainly not the most irregular format, fit into the quilt of rectangles on the Salon wall. In this context, Chantournay canvases probably held, then, I would like to suggest links to the miscellany of objects sitting on the tables of this room, 
rather than the paintings on which they hung next to on the wall. This miscellany of other objects that we often forget was also part of uh, the salon. So what then does this potentially mean for painting? In his review of the Salon of 1753, the pivotal art critic La Fonte Saint-Yenne leveled an extended attack on these paintings, representing the fine arts by Carl Van Loo that were executed for Pompadour's Chateau de Bellevue and that are now in San Francisco. He described them as four overdoor paintings in which the artist's choice to represent the artist in the artist's choice to represent the arts infantilized brought low expressed the bigger problem of paintings and painters who engaged in the lowly tasks of decoration, things like overdoors, something that this critic attributed to ignorant or uncaring patrons, and specifically women like Pompadour who commissioned them. Emphasizing their subjects, Lafont did not acknowledge the fragmentary state, though, of Van Loo's canvases as presented at the Salon, something that must have been entirely obvious to Salon visitors. Ovals, as he described them, hardly captures the complex framing by which the edges of Van Loo's fine arts, as originally conceived, effectively constricted around the figures, resulting in a visually tattered and unstable border. Viewed today in person and even in most publications, they appear, these paintings are reproduced, in conventional rectangular frames, their compositions artificially built out to fill in the corners and create autonomous, easel paintings as we've come to expect them. Their original outlines, roughly cartouche-like, can be reestablished, however, through technical examination and x-rays, as seen here, that reveal their original stretchers made of complicated woodworking that fit them snugly into the reserves in Bellevue's boiserie-covered walls. Just to flip back to other images, but to show you this kind of stretcher. Etienne Fessard's prints after the series in 1756, seen here at the upper right, clearly delineate their original shield-like form. Media aside, these were, in effect, figural vignettes, like Boucher's Five Senses, in which the center is prioritized, hard edges diffused, and perspectival depth is minimized. The impact of rectangle versus original format can be extreme, I think, and often detrimental to how we perceive these works today. Here in the example just of painting, the curve of the original frame took its cue from, and almost seems in a way to support, the nude model. While extraneous architecture and drapery that seem unnecessary to us were not present in the original. When La Fonte saint Young criticized these paintings, he failed entirely to alert his reader to the context for which they were intended, simply as a practical consideration or to take this into account when making his own evaluative judgments against them. Indeed, many of the faults that he leveled at these paintings, their lack of perspective, even lack of content in a repetitive, serial approach, could just as easily be seen as successful solutions in the context for which they were executed, which was not, of course, the salon or museum gallery space at all. Rather, they were carefully integrated and into an interior, as shown here, in an elevation from Bellevue's now lost Cabinet de Compagnie by the wood carver and designer Jacques Verbrecht. Spaces for Van Loo's canvases are each clearly labeled here, tableau. While the ornament here in this uh, elevation of the wall may be said to describe distract from the painting, the elaborate framing also effectively focused attention on the subject. Carved wood, which inventories indicate was white with gilded detail, outlines large planes of mirrors and windows to which the majority of the room surface decoration was actually devoted. The empty frames of Rebecca's drawing, not unlike ornament prints, empty cartouches, echo the shells that crown the mirror above the chimney and that are found settled at the bottom of the wall here and here. They beg then, I think, an equivalence between Van Loo's painted and Verbrecht's gilded decoration that recalls Karsten Harry's description of a pictorialization of ornament. A digital reconstruction by Frank 
de Vegion, uh, slightly jarring, but actually coming very close to, based very closely on drawings in the Archive Nationale and on inventories, evokes the complex visual experience into which Van Loo knew that his fine arts, these canvases, were to have been placed and would have been one of multiple competing components in a vast range of media. And of course, this doesn't even include furnishing. Reconstruction of this kind is not my aim here, and the degree of fantasy and projection facilitated by this kind of image here uh, should be acknowledged. Nonetheless, I think that this context should be helpful in informing or tempering our viewing of these now much modified canvases as they exist today. Indeed, Van Loo's figural groups might be likened to motifs after Watteau, painted onto a pair of mounted Sevres vases that receipt, uh, sorry, not sev vases, mice and vases, that receipts record were in this room. They seem to have been lost, but I think they must have been very close to this example, with porcelain flowers as well. This is an exemplary expression of the Marchand Mercier's powers to move between trades, media, and images that was not unlike those applied to Duberry's table that we saw, or Boucher's five senses as applied at Sev. This object, but overwhelming to us today, embodies the combinatory mind and the concept of an integrative interior in which each piece formed by independent authors and in different media locked together one into the other. Indeed, Van Loo's paintings for this room quickly came to circulate as motifs in the decorative arts. A gold snuff box dated from 1756 to 7 that you see here on the left, is actually very close to one uh, described in the inventory of Pompadour's brother, the Marquis de Marigny. And it distributes the individual motifs uh, from this room around the sides of the object, and they're given gold frames of a kind of rocaille format. And in 1777, Sev's enameler Dodin, who also executed some of the objects we've seen earlier, painted this cup with Van Loo's music, given a rather simple oval frame. It was in response to this kind of cutout or irregularly shaped painting that Lafont wrote his critique of the literally limited, predetermined space made for painting versus decoration, and particularly mirrors in 1747, when he argued famously, at least for 18th century art historians, that French patrons of this time had asked painters only to fill in, quote, to quote, fill in a few miserable gaps, over doors, over mantles, and the tops of a few pier glasses. More often, art historians have cited this example, still intact, from the Hotel de Soubise, where Boucher, too, had participated. In 1755, Cochin satirically praised, quote, that where our genius, our French genius of patronage triumphs, is in the frames of overdoor paintings, for which we can claim we have provided an infinity of different designs. Painters hate us because they do not, because they do not know how to arrange their compositions with the encroachment of our ornaments onto their canvases, but too bad for them. Such a great display of genius should stimulate their creativity. These are the kind of bouchrimé that we give them to fill in. This reference to bouchrimé uh, is to a kind of game um, in which a list of rhyming words was supplied and for which verses were to be filled in in this instance, in a periodical, so that in one issue you would receive the first, and in the next you would receive answers. The spatial arrangement of the form, either blanks left in, blanks with a list of words aligned to the right, or their opposite, uh, terminating in blank spaces, would therefore have been very familiar to readers of the Mercure, where Koshan has published his, uh, his review, and in fact this kind of competition dated from at least the 1710s or 20s. But in fact, as Cochon's backhanded compliment suggests, much like Boucher's five senses, in works such as these, artists met the mandate given them with great sophistication. The degree to which they carefully worked out the compositional problems posed by contorted frames is evident in the large, thus far surprisingly little studied category of composition drawings for Chantournay paintings. I show you range here, there are many, many, uh, often relatively unacknowledged, even when people are writing on them. Uh, here you see them by Boucher uh, and some of his contemporaries. Clearly, like the Bouchrimé competitions cited by Cochin, painters' various solutions to the decorative demands of the space were signs of accomplishment. 
As I hope we have seen, there were structural, in these instances, maybe even mechanical aspects to many 18th century painters' practice that made their works ripe for use in other fields and indeed on other objects. At times, this means that indeed their work does approach the logic of decoration, in which motifs might be applied as a kind of visually pleasing pattern. And the ability of the image to move and be transposed is of central importance. But as Lafont's critique reminds us, in the context of the Salon, this was not what was desired. Rather, at the Salon, autonomous freestanding easel paintings were increasingly the norm this being, of course, the precursor of the modern museum gallery and the way that we typically encounter art today. We can see this rectangular mandate, if you will, here somewhat triumphantly in a view of the Salon of 1785, in which Jacques-Louis David's masterwork, The Oath of the Horatii, dominated and heralded a new moment in the concept of the publicly exhibited painting. This tendency toward the autonomous work and the rectangle was in fact buttressed by the market. Increasingly, much like the Salon's own guidebooks, auction catalogs wanted to name a single painter, not multiple painters, when it listed a work of art. And we've seen that in fact, in some instances, later owners opted to remove things that had been added and confuse their authorship, as we saw with Lancre and Kaff's kitchen scenes, or even more radically, by cutting down and building out the chantournée or shaped canvases into rectangular formats that more readily read as art. These material transformations are witness to, I think, the increasing pressures exerted on the objects made by painters, which is to say, practitioners of a fine and not a decorative art. But they also hid the signs of painting's real links to the wider range of 18th century visual culture, particularly and I would like this to be the emphasis at the level of how painters and artisans in various media thought about and actually used images. Thank you. <laughs>